topic that I was given today was neurobiology of meditation. And I'm very grateful to Nimhans and my colleagues here, Dr. Uday Chaudhary and Dr. Avede for this presentation. They have given me a significant input and my thanks to Dr. Prabhat Chand as well. I am missing him today. So basically the objective of today would be is to why do we need to consider meditation in neuropsychiatric disorders? Then think about what meditation is. Briefly, I will go through the history of meditation, its clinical application, and then discuss in detail the neurobiology of meditation. Basically, as we all know, that neuropsychiatric disorders are on an increase worldwide. If we look into the details, like who says, there are about almost 2 million users of alcohol all over the world. And in terms of illicit substance misuse, there are about 185 million people and in depression, about 300 million people worldwide. The statistics are alarming. They are increasing. In 2000, it was reported that alcohol was responsible for almost 4% of the deaths globally. And now it has gone up to almost 6%. Who estimates that by 2020, the situation might become more worse? The mental health problems will contribute to almost one third of the total disability. Depression will be the biggest global burden on the world and more and more countries are focusing their policies of mental health towards that as it is to be the leading cause of disability. But the even more worrying part, suicide, which is most common, Almost 8 lakh people die of suicide every year. Who believes that this is going to be the leading cause of death amongst the youngsters, the people who are going to take it forward, the, the responsibility to carry us forward. So in terms of treatment, in terms of neuropsychiatric disorders, we have a big challenge. Unfortunately, in spite of the best treatment modalities available to us, currently we do not have any long-term cure for mental illness. And then again, the conventional behavioral or pharmacological treatment that are at our disposal and uh, that are at our disposal are only effective in the treatment of symptoms. We do not have any curative effect. And they also come along with a number of things. But first, the side effects. If you have think about first generation antipsychotics, you have the rigid patients. If you think about the second generation antipsychotics, you have the stout patients. And then, with the newer treatment emergence, there is escalating cost. And of course, the biggest and the one problem which we all face is the uncertainty in terms of long-term treatment. So, in terms of future, we need to broaden our horizon. We need to think of innovative concepts and therapeutic models, which can not only help us to treat the symptomatology, but also think about the amelioration of the mental illness. And one of these, which is emerging now very rapidly, especially in the world, is meditation. The advantage of meditation is that it can be used potentially both either alone or as an adjunct to the conventional therapies that we have. And it is believed, believed to be very cost effective, as well as, presumably, so far, free of any side effects. So that is a debate about that. So if we look in terms of defining, if we look into the dictionary, what we find is that meditation is described as a noun, which basically means the action or practice of meditating, which means to focus one's mind for a period of time in silence or with the aid of chanting for a religious or spiritual purpose as a method of relaxation. But that definition does not apply to medicine. It is very narrow. It will be interesting if we look back and think about the etymology of the word meditation. In our oldest Sanskrit language, meditation is called midyo. Basically, that means I judge or contemplate. That definition or meaning is quite different from the current dictionary meaning we have. And I will come and talk about that much more later on. In terms of other language, meditation is mentioned both in Latin, Old French, and Greek. And again, if you look into these words, there is a common thread. All these words come from the pre-root med, 
and this word has gradually come on and been defined as medary which means to heal and medicus which means a physician so is there a link between meditation healing and us as physicians so i think if we define meditation in a different way especially in the context of medicine that meditation is essentially a physiological state whereby there is reduced metabolic activity which is quite different from sleep and that elicits a physical and relaxation which is reported to enhance psychological balance and emotional stability but then again the question remains as to how this happens so basically if you think about the conscious states if we have the sleep cycle a sleep state then you have the wakefulness state as well as the dream state but meditation stands apart as the fourth state a supra conscious state consciousness if we step back and look into the history of meditation there is a lot of debate meditation was first described about 3000 years before the common era but in terms of mentioning its first mention is in veda where they describe how a person could attain spirituality through the implication of meditation later on the greatest change in meditation the greatest exponent of meditation from buddha comes across in the 600 bc he uh four noble truths and the eight methods of nirvana then we have page patanjali discussed by a previous presenter a couple of weeks ago he had those eight yoga sutras page patanjali was lost in time but swami vivekananda brought them back gita also mentions meditation and the spiritual life slowly the meditative practice spread to the west and influenced the religions in the west especially judaism to the self root around the 100 years before the christ but there was a burst of meditation and its acceptance after the turn of the century you had the greek plotinus who spread the meditation and established the first hall of meditation this was further Did and Monk Joshua, sorry Monk Dosho, the Japanese monk, he was responsible for establishing meditation meditation in Japan. He traveled to Japan and found the Zen meditation. He spread and used the word meditation. Around the 12th century, Monk Goigo, also known as the Guy or the Angel. he was responsible for coining the term meditation as we know it he described basically four ladders which would be which a person can use to establish or get nirvana the first step was oration uh, the first step was reading the second was contemplation the third was reading uh, basically which meant prayers and then getting nirvana or meditation around the 18th century the huge burst of meditation in the west the shift of focus from orient to the occident and you had the vipassana movement or the insight movement where there was a lot of focus on how a person controls their breathing their thoughts feelings and their actions in the 1960s the focus shifted and there was more focus on the hatha yoga which focused on the various asanas and then came transcendental meditation the application of meditation in science was propagated by professor john kabat-zinn the professor at university of massachusetts he developed the mindfulness based cognitive therapy if we look into the types of meditation there are a number of them which includes like buddhism then you have the fluidic movements like the tai chi sufi dancing the trans dancing of shamanism and then you have the various postures like the kriya yoga the sudarshan kriya yoga the raj yoga and in the western meditation western world you have the transcendental meditation the candle meditation and more imaginative sorts of meditation like sketching writing image etc 
meditation has found has found its application in medicine and the biggest proponents have been the mindfulness based cognitive therapy by dr t still and the mindfulness integrated cognitive behavior therapy by bruno keon nowadays meditation has been applied in various forms both in terms of physical and mental health problems especially chronic diseases like oncology copd psoriasis and cardiovascular problems in terms of mental health it has found applications in anxiety depression substance misuse somatization disorder and sleep but it does in here there is a huge role of meditation in health promotion in health awareness as well so how do we reach this meditative level the fourth level well the specific physiological state can be attained by an interplay which is very complex and multidimensional and includes most of the bodily systems the neurological system the endocrine system the medic metabolic system and the autonomic system during the meditative phase an individual moves from conscious to a subconscious level and researchers have shown that there are changes which can be identified and documented through the eeg in terms of both alpha waves the theta waves and gamma waves as well as there is a differential change in the functioning functioning of different parts of the brain the alpha waves are basically the waves which act as a gateway between the consciousness and the subconsciousness they act as a bridge what they do is provide the individual during meditation to have the ability to remember what has happened during the meditative process then you find that you have the theta waves during meditation researchers have shown that the intensity and the frequency of theta waves increase there is a burst of theta waves and what they do is provide the depth and profundity of the meditation as a result you have the imagery the reverie and the creativity there has been a lot of talk about gamma waves recently as well these are the fast waves which have which function between 25 to 100 hertz but mostly 40 hertz they usually originate from the thalamus and then sweep backwards from front to the back of the brain and during the process what happens is the circuits oscillate in synchronicity and out of which what happens is that the percept comes to the foreground comes to your attention and as a result find what found by the researchers is in the during the meditative process there are bursts of gamma waves especially in some localized centers as a result of which the brain is in a maximally sensitive state and that provides us the increased consciousness that supra consciousness and the associated bliss plus the intellectual activity as i mentioned previously during this process of the brain going from the conscious to the subconscious state there is a differential change in the various bodily parts of the brain so if we look into the frontal lobe the lobe which is mostly evolved which is responsible for the executive functions like reasoning self awareness what happens is that that goes offline then the parietal lobe the seat of our sensory integration which helps us to sort of focus on things and gives us awareness about the concept of time and the surroundings is slowed down the diverticular the reticular region which acts as the center of the brain which controls us which controls which processes the information which comes through the periphery and puts the brain on alert seems to get reversed so instead of putting the brain on alert it puts it down to a subconscious level and then of course the thalamus the thalamus people of the brain so what it does it gathers all the information and it helps us respond to it but here again it is dampened so all of these help the brain to move from a conscious to a subconscious level then during meditation what we find is that there are changes in self awareness there is greater emotional control and more introspection the current research shows that there is a change in both the structure of the brain as well as the function of the brain. how does this happen well 
basically this PET scan, the PET scan and the fMRI research, what has been done, there have been uh, leading research by Kang et al, which shows that there is a differential change in the particle thickness of the brain. What they use the word is anteriorized. Basically, what they have showed is that there is an increase in cortical thickness over the frontal lobe, especially the anterior cingulate gyrus, and there is thinning of the occipital and the parietal lobe. As a result of which, the person is able to have bigger self-control, bigger emotional control, and have the feeling of introspection. Using DTI, it has been shown that the brain undergoes increased gyrification especially in the region of insula, which helps us for self-awareness and emotional control. Again, using fMRI techniques, it has been demonstrated that the axonal density, especially in sp uh, some parts of the brain, like the amygdala and the hippocampus, is increased. And all of these help us during the meditative process to have a greater awareness, greater emotional control and infection. Then, of course, during the meditative process, you find that there is a change in both attention and concentration. And that also seems to have a neurobiological as well as a neuromolecular role. Pioneering work by Dr. Andrew Newberg from the University Hospital at Jefferson's shows that there is a change in the cerebral blood flow. What they have done is map the... Uh, at the regional cerebral blood flow and have some pictures to show that. So basically what happens in spec that you find that the, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex shows increased metabolism. Comparatively, you find that the parietal lobes show a decreased metabolism and there is an increased metabolism in the limbic region. So what that does is that you are more aroused, you are more focused, and as a result of which, your attention and concentration improves. There are also within the hypothalamus pituitary axis. So what you find is that the cortisol levels decrease. There is an increase in the lactate as a result of which, because of the decreased cortical level, cortisol levels, there is an improved attention and concentration. There are changes within the neurotransmitter, uh, neurotransmitters as well. There is evidence to show that dopamine increases, serotonin increases, all of them which contribute to improved attention and concentration. But at the same time, there is a decrease, a relative decrease in <coughs> acetylcholine. The other aspect of meditation is relaxation and stress reduction. Again, there is growing evidence to show that that might have a neurobiological correlate. What happens is there is a change in homeostasis of the body. So as a result of meditation, you find that there is a decrease in the pulse rate, the cardiac output, and there's also a decrease in the respiratory rate. You find that the blood flow to the liver, to the uh, to the kidneys decreases and there's increased blood flow to the heart helping us increase the cardiac output there's also a change in the muscle reflexes the muscle reflex time decreases and the response to stimulus also goes down this happens due to a decreased oxygen utilization and decreased carbon dioxide production if we look into the skin response there is an increased galvanic skin response what that does, researchers have shown that in, in people who meditate is it provides a faster, quicker response to stress and the patients, the person who does meditation is able to relax much more quickly than other individuals. Then there is a change in neuromodulators as well. There is research to show that there is an increased GABA activity. As we all know, GABA is an inhibitory molecule. What it does is that it provides the sense of calmness, the sense of relief, which all adds up to the relaxation and stress reduction. So basically, if we think about what I've just discussed, 
there are, if you look into the neurobiology, there is changes within the subconsciousness, there are changes within the attention and concentration, there are changes in the self-awareness, and there is relaxation and stress reduction. What that does? Well, if we look in terms of psychology, there are changes in a person's attitude and personality. There is more compassion, there is more awareness about the other's feeling, and then of course, there is a change in the person's learning ability due to changes in memory organization, and that gives an improved problem solving ability as well as creativity. Due to the changes in the personality, you have you find that a person is much more changed in their interpersonal relationships as well. As a result, there is a change in the theory of mind, and you find that the person is much more aware about what's happening to the other individual, and they are able to accordingly adapt themselves, change themselves much more, and there is an increased self awareness, self actualization. So you have much fulfillment as well. So, so far as to what we discussed, there is changes in both in the uh, in the brain functioning, which are both quantitative, like for example, the changes in the cortical thickness, the changes in the gyrification, etc., the changes in the regional cerebral blood flow, and then you find that you have qualitative changes as well. So, for example, you have changes in a person's attitude to life. You have changes in a person's interpersonal relationships, etc. What that does, researchers believe, is a stimulation of some dormant neurons within the brain, and that results in a development of a center which is higher than the neocortex. This seems to have some people have used the term God module for that, and this seems to have an inhibitory effect on the current neocortex. Result of which there is inhibition of the mind and the consciousness, which leads to a non-dual experience. So you no more have a separate mind or a separate consciousness. All is one. And this leads to what we call eternal sat, chit and anando, or eternal existence, eternal consciousness, and eternal bliss. Thank you.